Hi, this is Joe Gillespie with TPG Software. I'm going to be going through a brief demo of our uh, latest Derivative Genius uh, product. Uh, today I'll show you how to do the basic setup for a plain vanilla interest rate swap. We will do the, the setup and I will also show the corresponding general ledger entries that, um, are, that are related to the, uh, to the transaction that we enter as well. Uh, to get started, uh, the process for entering, for entering a derivative in the system is pretty straightforward. Um, in the system we have uh, the ability to set up templates for our uh, interest rate swaps, options, uh, futures, forwards. Uh, till today we will just set up a, uh, a new instrument, uh, which will be our template. So I just go to the, uh, to the instrument tab at the top of the, uh, the menu bar. I can select add new and the, it will allow me to create all of the basic information for the particular um, instrument that we're dealing with here. So I'll just go ahead and create a, a symbol. So I'll just call this IR and I can put a brief description of the, uh, of the ticker that's, that we use to relate back to the, uh, to the instrument itself here. Select an exchange. A holding type, and the holding type is what our processor uses to determine what type of security it is, so we know what type of calculations to run through. So here I'll select an interest rate swap. And I can select an instrument group, which just allows for more granularity um, for reporting purposes. Um, for options, future, forward contracts, uh, we can also set up um, the tick ID. Uh, we can set up a contract quantity. Uh, for the purpose of today's discussion, this won't be necessary. Um, so we'll just save um, the, the template here. And I can go set up the default uh, templates for each leg. So I can uh, I'll just apply a currency. So we'll use US dollars. Um, I'll say this is my fixed leg. Uh, payment frequency, we'll say is monthly. We'll use an actual 360 with a modified business day convention. Uh, no end of period adjustment. Um, we'll set the holiday list to New York. Uh, this swap will not have a delay. It will also not have an, uh, an end of month adjustment and it will not be compounding and um, we won't be rounding or truncating the rate. So I can set up the basic parameters um, for, my, for my payment schedule on the swap on this form. Uh, this allows us to determine the appropriate interest schedule, uh, the day counts to use, and also how to determine the appropriate business day uh, for the payment. I'll save my information here. Now if I go back to the rate information, if this was my floating leg, this would allow me to, to um, to predefine an index and uh, reset uh, frequencies um, that that would use that we could use on the template level for each swap that we fill out. Um, I'll go ahead and set up a floating leg now. So we'll walk through that. So I'll apply my currency. So we'll go back to the drop down. Select U.S. dollar. I'll leave the fixed rate box unchecked to designate that this is a floating leg. Uh, we'll have another uh, monthly frequency. Uh, we'll use the same actual 360 day count, modified business day convention with no end of period adjustment. Uh, we'll use New York for my holiday list with no delay days, um, no end of month adjustment, um, a not compounding, a non compounding swap and we will not round or truncate um, any of the rates or the payments. So we'll save the payment calendar. Now we can go into the rate information tab. And this is where I can define and designate a, um, a, an index that I would like to use as a default for this particular uh, template that I'm setting up. So in this case, we'll use just three month LIBOR. Um, I'll define that I would not like to round the rate. Um, we'll put a spread so we can do plus or minus a spread. I'll enter the spread and basis points um, with an 
index multiplier of 1. When I click Create Formula, this will go ahead and bring in um, the formula that I've set up here so it'll know to take the three-month LIBOR plus 157 basis points. Um, so I will go ahead and save this information. And I've set up a template now. Um, the next step that I can do is actually enter the transaction. So now that we've set up an instrument template, if we'd like to add a new derivative, we can click on the derivative icon from the menu bar and select Add New Derivative. The form that will appear will allow us to capture all of the, the details related to this particular transaction, starting with the transaction ID. The next step will be uh, selecting an instrument that I have. Uh, we'll select the instrument that we just set up. And you'll notice after we select the instrument, all of the defaults that we set up on the instrument earlier, they flow through to, the, to this particular transaction now. So I can enter my notional amount. So we'll enter 10 million for notional. And I'll enter a, desc a description that's related to this particular transaction. So we'll say this is a cash flow hedge for our bond portfolio. Under the derivative detail, the next item that we'll have, we'll select the type of derivative. So we can define this as a swap. And we'll also be prompted to uh, select the counterparty for this transaction. Uh, for this transaction, uh, we can just use Barclays. And if we had any contacts at Barclays that we'd like to capture or any wiring instructions, uh, we can set those up on the counterparty level to have those available on this particular form and also uh, to show on any uh, reporting that we generate as well. So any payment advices that we, could, that we would create, they could pull this information Next, we'll have the trade date. So we'll go back to uh, July 1st. We'll say that this, this swap was traded back in July 1st. We'll say that it was effective July 15th. And we'll also say that it terminates um, on July 15th of 2011. So as I go through my, uh, my date box here, I can easily define and move between, um, between different years and months. Um, we have the settlement calendar uh, that New York will be fine. And we can select a portfolio. In this case, we'll select the derivative portfolio. Um, we can define default pricing sources for each derivative that we load. So the pricing source is uh, the price that we would use if you load prices from your counterparty. If you have a, a pricing vendor, um, we can also define that here as well. So we'll capture that. If you'd like to capture the counterparty transaction ID, uh, an accounting number, um, we obviously have the forms here for you to enter that information. Uh, the holding type again and the instrument group drive the calculations that we perform on this particular transaction. Uh, you can define uh, the principle if principal is exchanged, if it's a chain, if it's exchanged at, on the maturity date, or on the effective date and the maturity date. Here we'll say it's no exchange of principal. And the last item under the derivative detail that we'll set up here is the the general ledger group. So the GL group is how we link this transaction to it, uh, to the uh, particular accounts on your general ledger that you'd like to use. So here I'll select um, a generic a GL group that we have set up. And on the bottom half of the form, we can define the pay leg and the receive leg and also the fixed leg or the floating leg. Um, So right now you'll see that we have the pay fix defaulted. We can toggle between uh, defining this as a pay fixed or receive fixed. In this case, we'll say it's a receive fixed. And I can enter my um, the rate that I'll be receiving. So we'll say 2%. And the frequency, day count, business day convention, holiday list, currency type will flow through from the instrument defaults that we've set up earlier. So here I will also define my payment date. So we'll define this as the 15th. And now I can move on to the, to the floating leg of the transaction, uh, which is the value that I'll be paying. Uh, I'll select um, three-month LIBOR in this case. Um, I can enter my spread. Uh, we can capture positive spreads and negative spreads. So I'll just enter a spread in basis points. We'll say 150 points. And I can again define the frequency, the day count, business day convention, a holiday list, and currency type. I can also set up a default payment day for this transaction. Now that we've set up the basics on the transaction, we can save this, and the records have been saved. Now that they've been saved, we can go um, 
review more of the details that we capture for this transaction. So we'll have all of the uh, payment parameters captured on the payment calendar. And keep in mind, this is all captured on a leg level. So for each leg, we define, uh, you can define different payment frequencies, different day count conventions, different business day conventions. And you'll notice on the, the right side of the form, we have the beginning of accrual, the first end of accrual, the beginning of the last accrual, and the last payment date. Now this is all driven off the effective date of the swap, the payment frequency, and also the pay date that you define on the transaction. Uh, the rate history will show all of the rates that we have effective for this transaction. Uh, for the fixed leg, it will show just one rate. On the floating leg, as you begin processing through, uh, through payments and rate resets, we'll capture all of the history here on the bottom half of the form. We can capture the notional history, so if notional is changing over time, we would have, uh, we'd be able to show the effective date and the, uh, the current notional balance as of the date. If you have any amortizing swaps, um, you can load an amortization schedule, um, and we can define our system to, to go off the schedule that you load um, to appropriately reduce the notional value on the swap. Um, the payment history tab will show all of the payments you've processed through. It'll also project the next payment that we have coming due on the system. Um, the, accrual the accrual and payments tab will capture uh, the daily history on, uh, on each leg um, as far as the daily accrual, a uh, daily accrual balance, any interest adjustments that may have occurred on that day, and also any payments as the payments come due. So we can close out of the form here. So now that we have the, the swap set up um, and the transaction entered in the system, if we save the transaction again, we can go process this. So now that we have the transaction entered in the system, the next step will be to process the position, which by process we mean ultimately uh, calculating each day's value. So the processing will uh, create the general ledger, ledger entries. It'll also create the daily accruals um, and calculate payments. It's ultimately how we uh, move the system forward. So here we can start processing from 715 to 716. So we'll click process. And the processor monitor will appear. This will just show us a list of everything that the processor is doing. Um, if there are any errors during processing, this is where we would see the errors. Uh, but it gives us also a brief description of what step in the process it's currently on. So right now it says it's um, posting general ledger entries. And now it says that it's complete. So we close out of the form here. And after we have processed this, the, the transaction, um, now we can go find the daily uh, interest um, accrual general ledger entries. So we have our general ledger entries on this form. Uh, these would also be available in a detail and a summary level reporting that we have that's canned in the system. Um, also, if you have any, any swaps that are, that are callable, um, we can capture the call information on the form here. Um, we could also capture uh, swaptions on this form as well. So we have fees that we can enter. So if you have any uh, initiation fees, um, any termination fees, uh, we can capture that on a transaction level. Uh, we also show, um, calculate the payments that would be the net of the uh, pay versus receive leg. Um, and we can determine a date frame and calculate the actual net payment. So we would calculate the total amount, all any adjustments, and we net the values out. Uh, the fair value tab will allow you to enter uh, prices for this particular derivative. Um, so you can, uh, you would just select a, a pricing source, the fair value of the derivative, and you can enter DVO1's uh, duration, the price, um, any time value or intrinsic value that may be related to the, to the derivative or the transaction. We can capture all of these entries on our canned reports and the fair values will be the values that we use to determine the appropriate mark-to-market entries. So we have the GL entries again, so we have our daily entries. Um, again, we are able um, to select specific date, a specific date range um, when we pull back the entries. So we could have multiple days or we could have single days in this view. And we have the analytics tab, uh, which ultimately will show us the status code for the transaction 
it'll tell us you know, notional balances, um, it'll calculate the call dates, um, the net market value, um, durations, remaining notional DVO ones. Uh, we'll capture a lot of valuable information there. So that is really as easy as it is to set up a, a swap and generate GL entries in our system. It just takes a few minutes and it's uh, intuitive and, and straightforward to use.